Funding provided by the Richard P. Garmany Fund at the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving. I'm Ray Hartman. On this episode of Where Art Thou, we are in eastern Connecticut along the shoreline. Now, I love this part of the state. You've got beaches, you've got great views of Long Island Sound, and some pretty good fried seafood stands. Plenty of history as well. And just like all of the other places that we've been on this show, the shoreline has an abundance of artists and performers, and I want to learn more about them. Now, to help me do that, I have our Where Art Thou Shoreline East curator, Allison Kaufman, on the line. Allie is the host of Morning Mojo on WCNI Radio in New London, and she's also a contributor to Connecticut's Inc. magazine. Allie, are you there? Hi, Ray. It's great to be with you. Thanks for spending time with me. Oh, thank you. This is going to be a great day in this part of the state. But first, tell me a little bit about the art scene here. Ray, as you've already alluded to, it is a wealth of experiences here to be had on the shoreline. And and don't just limit yourself to the beautiful summer months that you know are that are so lovely because there's something going on here all year long. There's always something to find. And not only to find to see, but you can be a part of it down here as well. So we hope that we'll reach a lot of people and bring them on down to see the wonderful creatives we have in our area. Yeah, absolutely. So, Allie, where are you taking me first? Well, you know, it was a hard pick, but I believe you're off to see Colton Harris. Now, Colton Harris is the executive director of Writer's Block, Inc. That is a wonderful group that empowers the youth of the community and, and surrounding towns to really give them a voice. And not only give them a voice, but ignite a passion for the stage, creating art, and really expressing what's going on in their life, whether it's on the page or on the stage. Colton is also a wonderful musician in his own right, and he just dropped a new EP, so I'm sure he's gonna wanna talk all about that, and I hope he'll give you a listen, because it's a really powerful release. Well, Ali, uh, we're gonna head to Groton and meet Colton. Uh, thanks so much, and we'll be in touch later on in the show. Have fun, thanks so much. Let's check it out. All this melanin is a gift from the God who made the earth. All my brothers, all my sisters, check the mirror, know your worth. We got that joy. So we are here in Groton, Connecticut, in the basement of Colton Harris, where the magic happens. The dungeon? Did you call it the dungeon? The dungeon, yeah. It goes by a few different names. <laughs> Bat Cave Dungeon. We haven't got a copyright on it yet, so. So tell me a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so I'm a musician and a songwriter. Create a lot through musical expression and performance. Really love digging into the ways in which sounds can affect people's emotions, but also communicate narratives. I'm an actor, a director of, of mainly theater, especially devising original creative work that is centered around social issues. So a lot of people, they find they're, that they're talented and they kind of follow this austere path, but you had a whole different experience where you learned to make music with people that kind of had the same mindset that you did. Yeah, for sure, and that was a, an integral part of my journey. It was really about connecting with other musicians that were experimental and willing to bend genres. I've never liked any sort of categorization, you know, and in, in an excessive sense. I think categories are really important and they help us classify things and understand their vantage point and where they're coming from. However, I never felt pressured to stick to one genre or one instrument or one sort of style. It was kind of like, well, how do we want to express ourselves? What sound really best matches? And I think that what makes my musical expression and journey really an adventure is that I'm never chasing exclusively a sound, it's really a feeling. So if I feel it, or it feels a particular way to me, that's the way that I wanna go. And music to me is the key to time travel. If you ever wanna feel a feeling you felt, a song comes on, you're like, oh, I remember what it felt like to be in that car and we were chilling and cruising down the street. Absolutely. So I'm chasing those kinds of feelings and trying to create them. We need more 
than apologies. We need a change in the policies. Black moms holding the bodies of their babies lost while you sleep. Killers still out there roaming free, protected by a badge of safety. Supposed to be the land where we're free. Seems like a whole big lie to me. Over and over again, they killed them dead. And yet still nothing was said. I know you want to say that it's all lies, but we just want to hear about the black lies, the many that you torched and terrorized, and all the people still are demonized. How we as a people harmonize when our blood is still so red inside, and you killed us over and over, and over and over again. Killed them dead, and yet still nothing was said. Black blood flooding the streets, people dying, and we still can't breathe. All the names buried in graves, say them now, or they'll fade away. Tell me about your creative process. Uh, let's start first with what comes first. Does, is, it the, is it the music? Is it the lyrics? Yeah, my, my creative process really is anchored in instrumentation and musicality. I hear melodies first. Mm. I like to dig into the music and the way that the music makes me feel. I look at it really as a pursuit of hidden treasure, but also kind of like mining. It's a very much a mining process. It's We engage in the music and I just keep chiseling away to find out what is the music saying. I never try to take random lyrics and apply it to a right. piece of music. It feels inauthentic to me. I think that the music has such weight and power, and I think that that's what most people connect with first, and then the lyrics really are birthed out of that. So I really kind of chisel through, try to figure out what am I hearing or what am I saying, but ultimately, I sing what I see in my mind in these moving images, mm. and they're very vivid in my mind, so I don't write songs based on purely my experiences. I write poetry as well, so every so often, there might be a line or a word that I remember that I wrote. I was like, oh, maybe this will fit. I know that's why I wrote this back then, because right. it'll fit here. Let's talk about your latest project, the EP. Yeah. Tell me all about that. Yeah, so the project is called For Freedom. It was released on the 4th of July. A single was dropped on Juneteenth, and there was an initial song that sort of catapulted the whole project called Another One Dead, but that was released right after George Floyd's murder. And that was a really important project because it was really birthed out of the movement, and it was genuinely a project through which we were all just vessels and conduits for the message to really come out. Another one dead, another one dead. I can't seem to let this thing go. Lord, please save my people. Tell me about the songs, and is there a thematic approach to the CP? I mean, does it start in one space and then go to another space by Absolutely. the end? Absolutely, yeah. So the intro is I Can't Breathe, and that's starting from a very explicit space of if you seen the video of George Floyd, right, screaming out, I can't breathe. And then this EP ends with this song called Together We Will Win. And that song is really explicit about the journey um, exposing racism. But the message of it is that together we will win. So we're calling everyone together. We're not trying to ostracize anyone from this fight. We're all in this together. It's not about this person being pinned against this person. We need to come together so that we can all win. Yeah. Are looking real dark with all the hate they sparked. Can't put the fire out, so we just scream and shout. Yeah, we owe freedom, but they don't hear us. They'd rather not be near us. Instead, they fear us. Looking at our black skin, acting like we're not kin. So they treat us like we alien. Like we landed on a spaceship, a forced invasion that we had no say in. We're all made the same in our different shades. We're all made.
made the same, just in different shades. There's no harm there, so why must you complain? Your words come down just like acid rain. But together we will win, together we will win. Bring your tears and sorrows, we'll battle till the end. So, so what's next? Working on a, a concept album, working on just more music and more art to really create community and to really push the boundaries. And as I said, we're not really invested in just making music or making art for the present. I believe as artists, we have a responsibility to call people into the present, but also point them to the future. Yeah. Well, Colton Harris, uh, great performance. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the time and, and sharing. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. My name is Tara Wyatt, and this is Tumbleweeds in Niana, Connecticut. We are primarily a record store, music store. We sell CDs, cassettes, and records. Records has been the backbone for the 47 years we've been open. During the download phase, the sort of late 80s into the 90s, we had to convert into something else, so we turned into a hippie boutique. We've gotten a little bit more into the metaphysical uh, crystals, and um, we do a lot of local made, a lot of artisan, handmade, um, small batch made. Um, but tie-dye is definitely probably the biggest thing in here. I guess it all started definitely with my father. He was kind of the, kind of an encyclopedia of music. He grew up in East Hartford. Used to hop the train and go into the city and watch all the doo bands and the blues bands, and uh, he was definitely a blues guy. He wanted to have a music store, so he did. He opened the store in 74, and that was that. I got involved when I was 15. I liked shopping, so that's where everything else sort of started to really come into play. And this was uh, not what I wanted to do. I actually have an environmental marine science degree, and I was supposed to save the oceans, but. I do a lot of fair trade and a lot of organic here, so I've sort of implemented that over the years substantially. I really look at what's sustainable, both for the planet and both for humans. Growing up on the ocean and the sound, and uh, I was always interested in uh, definitely more sustainable living. That's definitely my thing. My dad always just was like, oh, that's cool, somebody will buy that, <laughs> so. I have met some amazing people, amazing friends lifetime friends, so uh, things like that are pretty amazing. You just, it's like a whole family, and that vibe, I think, kind of comes back around. I mean, there's people I see once a year, just catch up and, you know, everything's good. <laughs> we have a lot of jazz, that's our whole jazz section over there. Oh, nice. Um, and then our rock section, we have quite a variety here. So, a little bit of everything, everything from you know, Stranger Things to Singles, <laughs> Breakfast Club, Singles, obviously. I remember that movie. Yep, um, but... And of course, The Breakfast Club. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I just think it's family working here, you know? I've been here for so long, I just feel like Tara and I are like sisters at this point. Um, and I'm Definitely not... like people think we're yeah, the same person we get asked that the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't live in Niantic. I live in Pocketuck, but I still feel like a really connected to the community because I work here. You see a lot of the same customers coming in over years, so you get to know people a lot. We have all sorts of different customers. We have, you know, old hippie guys coming in looking for whatever Grateful Dad Pink Floyd they can find on vinyl. We have young, you know, girls in high school coming in looking for crop tops and headbands and whatever cute things. We have all, all walks of life come in the store. I think it's always smart to look at shopping local for starters. Um, we have the same things that Amazon has. You might pay a little more for it, but there's character behind what I'm selling. Um, you know, I'm looking at this table, for example, and I have five local artists just on this table, and then everything else is fair trade. Um, and, it, it's just, you know, there, there's a woman who's a teacher in town who makes some of these bracelets, another family friend of ours who makes something else. Literally everything in the store, I handpick. Every piece. I don't get assortments, and it just isn't that kind of shop. So I don't bulk buy. I, I literally handpick everything that comes in the door. These are nice clothes. I mean, these aren't like 
when I remember my hippie store in Tallahassee, yeah. Florida, it wasn't, this was, this was good, this is good material you've it's, got here. It's very high quality. It's all very small batch um, made and the dyes are just, these tie dyes are just absolutely incredible. Yeah. So uh, it's definitely uh, a labor of love. Um, I actually did have a second store. I just closed because of COVID. Um, that was called Indigo and it was entirely a sustainable women's boutique. Closing that was a little rough, but coming back here now for a couple months has been um, a wake up call to say uh, that I'm good at what I'm doing. At least that's what everybody tells me. So I'm gonna keep pushing. Um, and people love to come here. They love to just come in, they wander around. I'm seeing guys who started buying their records here in the 70s when they grew up in town, bringing their kids, their grandkids. So that's a whole story in itself. Um, to be able to see that in a store like ours, I don't know that you can really see that very many places. Well, we have one last stop on this great day in Eastern Connecticut. And to see where we're headed next, let's get our Where Art Thou Shoreline East curator, Allie Kaufman on the line. Allie, are you there? I am, Ray. How you doing? I'm glad you're back. Thanks. You know, as well as all the wonderful creatives we have here that are happening now, we have a wealth of history in our area. And one of the histories that we're so proud of is of the Native Americans that were here first. And their history is getting carried forward. One of the ways that's happening is with Anawan Whedon. And that's who you're going to see next. So, Ali, tell me a little bit uh, about him. He is not only a Native American performer and dancer, he's also a very accomplished jewelry maker. Now his jewelry that he makes is true to the Native American culture. Not only is it beautiful, but the interesting part is how it gets made in the Native American tradition, of course. So I don't wanna give away too much because I'm really hoping he's gonna show you where he gets his materials, how he processes the materials and how they become gorgeous jewelry. Well, that sounds super cool. I can't wait to meet Anawan. Hey, Ali, great job today. Uh, some great picks for us. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It was an absolute pleasure, as always, to connect with you and all the great folks at Connecticut Public. All right, let's go meet Anawan. Uh, he's the one who, I guess, revived the art. It was dormant for many years. Um, just personally got into it because it's a great way to represent my region. I travel a lot, go to a lot of other communities, uh, a lot of other reservations. And when you see how they have their pride, obviously, just being worn everywhere, a lot of artwork being done in the community and, you know, ways to represent your, your culture and show it's alive. Like, you know, it's something that clearly is lacking here in New England. I mean, like, uh, and to no fault of our own, it's just, most people are still looking for buffaloes, teepees, and turquoise, so this is our turquoise. <laughs> tell me tell me about wampum. If you can imagine the time that it takes to turn this particular shell that people, again, trip over at the beach all the time in New England, they don't realize, like, it's really, honestly, just this one corner of the shell that's thick enough to actually make that tubular bead. You know, yeah, you got a lot of purple all the way around the rim, but as soon as you get down into it, it doesn't, if it doesn't run all the way through, that's not a purple bead, you know, it's only purple on one side. Yeah. And you want to have purple throughout. Uh, this was traded, so once you had strands such as these, and the white, white was also made, uh, whelk and conch, you didn't have to make it out of the white of the quahog, but these are specific, these are quahog, suquahog. That's where that word comes from. Oh, is that right? Yes, uh, Sukwahug, uh, dark shell clam. Wampum Peak, actually, just like Wampanoag. Uh, my mom's tribe were from the Cape. Cape Cod sees the sun before every other tribe in this country. We knew that for thousands of years. So people of the first light, that's what we've always called ourselves. Wamp implies light. So the Wampum Peak was actually the white beads. The Sukwahug were the darker beads. But if you had strands of beads like these that you had gave to your chief, your chief, he or she, could then trade them to other communities, building bonds and uh, unions. And this was traded all the way to uh, Anishinaabe, Ojibwe tribes of the Great Lakes, uh, Minnesota area, mm. even still today. 
our chiefs, they were proud to, you know, wear our history. So this was history that you could literally wear. Um, not just you yourself, but you know, like you could literally put on something that your your great great grandfather mm -hmm. probably made some of these beads, and now you get to wear that yourself and carry that pride. Um, yeah. You get to show your history, uh, events and things that were important to you. Yeah. Um, and these were all just different forms of doing that, you know. Um, mm -hmm. So this was documentation. So it's telling a story. Specific, yep. Specific events. Um, they, they literally have a two-row wampum belt. So these these are more ornamental, you know, uh, wares, whereas the belts, such as these, and longer. A um, lot of beads, as you can imagine, to tell a story. A lot of time to take just to make one bead, just, just to give it to your chief. And that was your way of showing, I appreciate your leadership. Um, but yeah, there was a lot of process. The whole community would be involved in uh, who gets to make the best beads, who gets to decide what story, and then, of course, who's going to weave all this together so that it would stay together for a while. Uh, let's talk about your jewelry. Tell me, tell me about it. Uh, First Light Fashion is what I call my business. Um, mm -hmm. I, I just, I fall in love with it as a, all the mediums I've used. I, I first started carving wood, uh, again, at Plymouth Plantation, making spoons, you know. I'm very passionate about my eating. Mm -hmm. I didn't get this size from not eating. So <laughs> when you get into it and you start carving and like, because as you can see, this is what it starts with. But a lot of people steam these to open them up, cook them, what have you. Um, I use my little shuffling knife that my grandpapa showed me, which gets the knife in there, opens them right up. Once you have the whole clam open, obviously scrape the meat out and make use of that. I usually give that to the elders and stuff. I can only eat so much. But then you have to keep these together. Like this hinge, as you can see, is separated. That's dangerous. If I lose one, I won't know what the actual match is. But when you have a perfect match, they're all like snowflakes. They're like, there's none that are identical. And the closest you can have is the top and bottom of the same shell. Now, making the cuts on the same exact part of the shell, even though the shell's designed a little differently. It's, it's really an art to, to, again, try and capture the identical left and right sides, if you will. The shell itself, again, uh, once it's separated, it's going to be easier to manage them. Um, so you're basically keeping them together to store them. Once you start working on them, you're probably going to rip it apart. Uh, one of the hinges is one of the first things I remove. Uh, not really many uses for that, but uh, you're trying to get to the rest of the shell, as you can tell. So right. a lot of purple on this one. So we actually have a lot of workspace, a lot of material, a yeah. lot of options. So uh, that hinge, like I said, I'm just going to get rid of that. Right? Yep. So this one I already cut. Round off the profile. Got to shave the meat, the bark off the back, as they call it, kind of yep. like the bark of a tree. From that point, then you start finessing. Just do it a little fine tuning. My goal throughout my whole life, really, I guess, without me even realizing it, has just been like, how do I, I had to fight to defend who I was. Like, I literally was told by my teachers in front of my classmates, like, no, your Indians don't exist anymore. Like, literally, and I, yes, and I was disciplined. I was de put in detention, I was given suspension. My grades were not good because I was counterproductive to what he was trying to teach the class. And luckily, I had a father who would come into school and address those situations when it got that bad. Um, and it's something, again, that I knew I was never going to let my children go through, or anybody's child if I could. So um, I wouldn't want to look back and just be like, oh, wow, there's probably more I could have done 
to represent my people because, uh, don't get me wrong, there is. There's more that we can do. And for me to have these resources, like I said, not be taken advantage of, when I go out to the Southwest and I see the Navajo people wearing their turquoise, everywhere you go, you go to Walmart, you go to any supermarket, they're wearing their turquoise. It's not like they just wait for a special occasion like a powwow. And like, uh, you know, a lot of people tell me, oh, you sell your stuff really cheap. And it's like, I'm not in it to make money. I need people to start wearing more of it. I need the stuff to be seen more. I need people to ask more questions and find out what it's really worth and what it means. Um, so I've had a lot of non-native people, oh, I can't wear that, can I? That's, that's, that's you guys' stuff, that's like sacred for you guys. And it's like, no, really, it's not. It's right. something that should be appreciated by anybody in New England. It really sums up New England. And again, when you're traveling, um, why not have a piece of home with you? Well, Anwan Whedon, uh, thank you so much. Your passion comes through, not only in the jewelry, but the things that you've told me today. So I really appreciate it. Yeah, no, thanks for coming out. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah. We don't say, uh, Bye, we say peace kanash till we meet again. So, katap thank yeah. you. What a great day here along the shoreline. I hope you enjoyed it. You know, it's people like Anawan and Colton that make this part of the state so special. Hey, maybe there's someone in your town, in your neighborhood, that's doing amazing creative things. Well, we want to hear about it. Drop us a line at whereartthou at ctpublic.org. Join me next week. We'll have another great adventure in the beat-up old company van. Until then, I'm Ray Hardman. Thanks for watching Where Art Thou? Funding provided by the Richard P. Garmany Fund at the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving.